It was in October, about two years ago, in 2004, the senior political correspondent for Fox News Channel authored a phony story. It was really to make fun of John Kerry, who had manicures. This fake news story actually made it on the website at Fox Channel News. And the reaction from upper management, as you can imagine, was not very pleased. In fact, it was reported by multiple sources that the senior vice president authored a memo to all the employees. The words of this memo are what I want you to pay special attention to this morning. In fact, I would like this to be a challenge for us to consider throughout this week on how we deal with people. He said, credibility is our lifeblood. When we make factual mistakes, we affect adversely all the hard work we've done. Think of that. Credibility is our lifeblood. Now, for a news channel, that's true. Credibility is their lifeblood. They must be seen as telling the truth. He further said, for that reason, we are implementing a number of changes. The use of our scripts cue for humor, sarcasm, parody, or other unprofessional conduct is strictly forbidden. Sounds like a reasonable reaction. But think about that. Humor, unprofessional, Think about what it is that a news channel professes. It professes to tell the news. It professes to tell the truth. Anything which is at variance with that goal is against what it professes. So what I want us to consider this morning is, is credibility our lifeblood as a Christian? And can humor be used in our life in a way which is against what we profess? How is it that humor, sarcasm, and parody can be referred to as unprofessional conduct? Look at the definition of unprofessional. Not professional. Not pertaining to or characteristic of a profession at variance with or contrary to professional standards of conduct or ethics. As Christians, we should be one who professes to follow Christ. So what did Christ say about certain things? A keystone, what we call the golden rule. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way that, that you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule. This is what we profess. Anything that we use humor for that goes against the standards of conduct of a Christian can be considered in our lives unprofessional. This idea of, of humor being used in an unprofessional manner is further uh, demonstrated in the website. Um, well, let me back up. Humor which violates the Christian principles which we profess. That is, if we use humor, humor in a way which destroys trust, uh, is caustic or cutting toward the others, that violates our golden rule. If it's used to manipulate others, it violates the golden rule. If it ridicules others, it violates the golden rule. Here's an article that I found on the web entitled, From College Life to a Professional Working Career. It says, taking the step from college life to a professional working career can be a very difficult transition for any student. You must stay professional in the workplace. After a couple of jokes gone bad, you will surely be out of a job. How can jokes go bad? That's the question. Jokes involving deceit. Sometimes I think people are involved in things that are unintentional. This is a classic sitcom uh, setup. A joke is told, perhaps involving deceit, where someone either overhears partially, but doesn't hear the, oh, I was joking, or doesn't understand and believes the deceit. Just saw a case on the, new, or on the TV recently where there was an American of Arabic descent, someone who offered him tickets to a baseball game played in a certain stadium. And his response was, oh, that stadium? I don't want to go there. That place is terrible. It ought to be blown up. And of course, someone walked by and heard that stadium, it ought to be blown up, and that's all they heard. 
Sometimes people only get part of the story, and it creates an incredible conflict. And as you can imagine, if we tell things in humor that we don't really mean, and then follow it up by, oh, I was just kidding. There's this ambiguity that people don't know what we're really saying. It tends to destroy trust in what we're saying. Another way jokes can go bad, you can use humor to disguise abuse, uh, perhaps belittling others. It's an ingredient in sexual harassment. Jokes about men tell about women. Jokes men, women tell about men can involve sexual harassment. Most large corporations today have very strict rules about sexual harassment, annual training on how to avoid it. One of the common themes I hear, don't tell jokes involving gender. Why? Because it's so easy for them to create an intimidating, a hostile, or an offensive working environment. It's a common way of ridiculing others, and sometimes it's not really intended, but that's the effect. And so we need to be very careful. It's an ingredient in abusive relationships. It's an ingredient in emotional blackmail. Emotional blackmail is a term sometimes given to a situation in which someone tries to manipulate the other by playing on their emotions. Their ups or downs and how they feel is governed by a certain person and how they treat them. This is an article from Psychology Today. This is very interesting. I want you to notice. It says, a joke's basic structure in which you say one thing and mean another is exactly what makes it such a useful tool in human relationships. Humor is inherently ambiguous. That's how it works. You're saying more than one thing and it's never clear exactly what the message is, says Martin. He's a psychologist at the University of Western Ontario. It allows us to put out ideas in a tentative way and change them if they're not well received. It's a flexible communication strategy, a way of exploring the conversational terrain. Interesting phraseology. This is what a lot of the world espouses. This is what we face when we go out into the world. This is the attitude. But you notice very carefully what they said at the very beginning. A joke's basic structure in which you say one thing and mean something else. If we as Christians are to provide things honest in the sight of all men, and yet people can't be sure what we're saying, people cannot be sure exactly what we mean, are we instilling trust by what we say? It's a very good question to ask. I listened to a man recently tell how his mother-in-law had trouble, had health trouble, because she had swallowed a, a feather while he was holding a pillow over her face. Now you say, oh, that's outrageous. He's obviously kidding. He said it with a straight face. He didn't smile. Was he really kidding? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes it's so outrageous we know he's kidding. Sometimes it's hard to tell. When it's hard to tell, are we instilling trust? If we profess as Christians to be trustworthy and our word dependable, do we sometimes find ourselves saying something and getting a reaction that's, I'm not sure if I believe you, and having to say, I promise, I swear to you, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm, if we have to follow up what we say with statements like that, we have to ask ourselves, do we say things which make people question if we're telling the truth or not? It's a very dangerous situation. And the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapter 5, Jesus says, Again you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. 
Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Now the focus here is on breaking oaths. The writings of the Jewish rabbins tell us that while they professedly adhered to the law, they had introduced a number of oaths and common conversation which they by no means considered as binding. For example, they might swear by the temple, by the head, by heaven, by the earth. As long as they kept from swearing by the name of Jehovah, they seemed to consider all others as acceptable to be broken. The argument that Jesus makes is that to swear by heaven or to swear by something that is closely connected to God, for example, uh, uh, Something as closely connected to God, for instance, heaven, is his throne. To swear by earth is also closely connected to God, for it is his footstool. He concludes, therefore, that by breaking one of these oaths is just as much of an offense as breaking an oath taken in the name of God himself. His conclusion is that we should keep all oaths and the practice of swearing by other things and then not considering them binding is of the devil. In fact, the idea is that we should be faithful and trustworthy and demonstrate that by simply letting our yes be yes and our no, no. There are some Christian principles that we need to keep in mind as we consider these things. Romans tells us to recompense no man evil for evil but to provide things honest in the eyes of all men. Peter wrote to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. People may accuse us of doing wrong, but the idea is that those should not be successful accusations. Although they may accuse, what they see are good deeds, and they may glorify the word of God. They may glorify God himself in the day of his coming. If they can successfully accuse us of evil, it tends to impugn Christianity. It tends to impugn the church. And so we need to be very careful that what we profess we actually act in such a manner that's consistent. Children sometimes will say, when caught in saying something that's not true, oh, my fingers were crossed, that didn't count. Well, guess what, adults do the same thing. Adults will say something and they will say, nobody got hurt, it was just a little white lie, it was convenient, it didn't hurt anybody. It's okay. Just like the Jews could say, oh, I made this oath, and I swore by the temple. But you know what? That's not by the name of Jehovah. It didn't count. And so today, people say things that aren't true, and they figure out a way to say, it didn't count. There's another socially acceptable way of saying it didn't count. It's used many times. We can just say, oh, I was joking. Let me back up for just a minute. Back in 1992, there were three men involved in a gun battle. They chose as a place to have this gun battle the Center Mall in, the Brooklyn, in a Brooklyn housing project in New York. And they went out and had this gun battle. None of them got killed. But here comes a principal from a public school system. He's looking for a child that left school. He wants to make sure the child is okay. He catches a stray bullet right in the chest. He dies. All three convicted of murder, second degree murder. They all appealed, and on appeal it was upheld that they were guilty of murder by uh, depraved, um, depraved indifference, that's the phrase, depraved indifference. Indifference means they didn't care. Depraved meant that they had no conscience about it. They put everybody's lives at danger, and they didn't care. They had no sense of conscience about it. It was upheld. Now, this quote from Proverbs. Like a madman shooting firebrands or deadly arrows is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. What can happen? You may have seen this in real life. You may have seen it on a television. A person uses a, a humorous statement in such a way 
that some people believe one thing and others believe another. For instance, somebody's come up with a, a plan. A person may say, that's a clever plan. And maybe by a wink, maybe by a smile, he lets some in the room know, that's a stupid plan. But the person whose plan it was might take him at face value and say, wow, I'm being praised, that's a great plan. It's a deception, isn't it? Later on, when the person whose plan it was learns what was really said, there are the feelings of betrayal, feelings of outrage, of humiliation, a deceit, an intentional deceit. When we practice intentional deceit and then follow it up by saying, I was only joking, he says it's like shooting flaming arrows, deadly arrows. That's not much different than shooting bullets in a public place. It may be a matter of depraved indifference, and that's the challenge to consider. How are we using these things? Are we using them in a manner which can harm others? The pushback. <laughs> when somebody's caught telling something humorous that is very destructive to others, what do they say? Well, consider this. Maybe you're in your backyard in the evening and you're shooting these flaming arrows because, hey, that's what everybody around you is doing. That's the thing to do. It's looked up to. And your neighbor complains. How do you react? How do you react? Do you say, look, your roof is too thin. Can't you take an arrow? But isn't that the comeback? Don't you have a sense of humor? Can't you take a joke? Let's be, let's be frank. Humor which belittles others, expresses hostility toward others, and then covers it with the phrase, I was only joking. It's not really humor. It's abuse, isn't it? We need to acknowledge that. We need to be very careful how we deal with people. Psychology Today article continues. It says the ambiguity of humor also allows people to express hostility without taking responsibility. Just kidding, they'll say, after delivering a punchline that feels more like a sucker punch. On the very same, often the very same comments can seem either supportive or undermining affiliative or hostile, depending on the context and the dynamic. Where you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy uses is very unclear. First of all, expressing hostility without taking responsibility. We see that all the time, don't we? Just kidding, they'll say, after saying something that's very vicious. And finally, this ought to give us a wake-up call. Even those in the world that say this is very useful, this is a way of exploring the conversational terrain, can tell you the line between healthy and unhealthy, nobody can tell you where it's at. It's dangerous. It's inherently dangerous. And so there are some things that are just out of place in our lives. Consider this passage from Ephesians chapter 5. He says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. These three sentences are very tightly linked. First of all, there should not be even a hint of sexual immorality or impurity or greed. And I think most of us would agree, look, we don't want to be sexually immoral people. Uh, we don't want to be impure people that is dishonest or guilty of, of crimes. And we don't want to be greedy people. These things are all at variance with what we profess. But you notice he's not saying we shouldn't have an involvement in that. His primary focus is there should not even be a hint and the focus for the hint is in the middle verse, verse 4. What can give hints of sexual immorality? What can give hints of impurity? Obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking. These are things which leave a hint. 
And so in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4, consider the foolish talk that he's talking about. Uh, these two, the words that are used for foolish talk and coarse jesting really aren't found anywhere else in the Bible. But the Greek, from it, we know what the meaning is. Foolish talk is simply silly talk, that is buffoonery, foolish talking. A buffoon is a person given to clowning and joking. There are some things that we might joke about, and there are some things we should never joke about. Matters of sexual immorality is something we should never joke about. Why? Because when we do that, it leaves a hint of something that shouldn't be there. There should never be a hint of sexual immorality. That's what he says. Of course, joking literally means well-turned, i.e. ready at repartee or witticism, in a vulgar sense, ribaldry or jesting. Uh, these things, joking about sexual matters, joking about impurity, people who wouldn't even consider being sexually immoral might joke about something, might joke about something that might lead to lust, shouldn't even hint about these things. As Christians, there are some things we just shouldn't joke about. Perhaps a man says to his wife, they're married, they're Christians, and he's very angry with her. They've had an argument. They've had a spat. And he says to her, if you do that one more time, I'm just going to divorce you. And it's so outrageous, she laughs, and he laughs, and it's funny. They think, oh, that's funny. There's nothing about that. She thinks, he surely didn't mean that. And then a few weeks later, he says it again. There's a seed of doubt planted in our mind. Does he really mean that or not? We can't be sure. There's a hint. There's some things we just shouldn't joke about. Husbands and wives, let's never let the D word, divorce, be part of our vocabulary. Because the things we joke about are the things we're considering. If you've talked about it, you've considered it. The things that you've considered are on your mind. The things that are on your mind, you may do. If we've said right up front, we don't want to do these things, let's don't joke about them. Let's not let there not even be a hint. I'm not saying that all humor is bad, but humor which involves deceit, abuse, contempt, manipulation of others, being injurious toward others, ambiguous communication so that others cannot trust what we say. These are all things that are at variance with the things that we profess. In fact, the pattern of expressing hostility that was talked about in the Psychology Today article and then removing all responsibility by saying, oh, I was only kidding, uh, is part of a behavior that I talked about earlier, emotional blackmail. And what's so significant about the concept of emotional blackmail is everybody considers it's a heinous thing to do. But when you look at the top ten things used as part of emotional blackmail, Number three is disguising abuse as humor. It's such a dangerous area. Hence, said impurity, immorality, or greed. These things violate Christian principles. We'll talk a little bit about sarcasm. Sarcasm is often used on television, and those who are quick-witted and sarcastic retort are often looked up to as sophisticated. These are people that are wise in the ways of the world. They're smart. They're sophisticated. Some programs even go to an extreme and make it so fast-paced, you're just trying to listen to what's being said, and, and it takes you a little while to figure out what they really intended. I want you to consider some things about sarcasm. First of all, the Greek word is sarcasmos. The root word is from sarx, meaning flesh. Literally, it means to tear flesh like dogs. Wow. The literal meaning ought to just give you pause for consideration. Wow, this sounds dangerous. Here's what the American Heritage Dictionary has to say. It's a cutting, often ironic remark, intended to wound. A form of wit that is marked by the use of sarcastic language and is intended to make its victim the butt of contempt or ridicule. Webster's New 20th Century Dictionary. A taunting, sneering, cutting, or caustic remark. A jibe or jeer, generally ironical, and the making of such remarks. Now you can see from these dictionary definitions, this sounds really negative. In fact, the literal meaning of to tear flesh like dogs is reflected in these definitions. 
Now, I have, I have a feeling that a lot of us look at sarcasm as not so bad. And yet, when you look in reality at the picture of it as defined, cutting, intended to wound, ironic. Well, irony, that's a good English technique, right? But look at what uh, ironic really means. If you look up ironical, it means meaning the contrary of what is expressed. And so we practice this thing of saying uh, the opposite of, of what is expressed. If something is, is really, really good, uh, young people will often say, ooh, that's bad. And they're using this opposite of what it means, right? And so when, when somebody says something and we don't believe them, we say, yeah, right. We don't mean it so much cutting, but we're expressing the opposite. We need to be very careful. Our use of language here could make it difficult to understand what we're really meaning. Sarcasm can be much more biting than the, yeah, right. Uh, sometimes somebody will make a criticism to another person, saying, you know, you really need to do something about this. You know, that's not right. And the person may come back with a statement of, yeah, well, I'm not perfect like you are. That's intended to cut, isn't it? That's intended to cut. What he's saying is, no, you're not perfect at all. In fact, you're a hypocrite about it. It's very cutting, very caustic. If sarcasm includes irony, meaning the opposite of what is expressed, we need to ask ourselves a question. When we say something that means the opposite, we're really meaning the opposite, can people understand what I'm saying? Can people trust what I'm saying? It's a difficult question, so we need to be very careful. Remember this meaning, to tear flesh like dogs. I think that ought to steer us away from sarcasm. Certainly the use which is intended to wound others. Sarcasm stings like a bee. You know, it's this idea of a bee comes up and he sticks a stinger in you and then he pulls it out. But things aren't the same, are they? And so it is that a cutting statement, you can say, oh, I was just kidding, but guess what? The wound is still there. The wound is still there. In Matthew chapter 12, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. We need to be careful how we're using our words. If we love others, if we profess to love others, if we profess to treat others the way we want to be treated, are we using our language in a way which cuts, that is caustic, which is destructive? Sometimes I think we do it and we don't intend to, but we see the effects, we need to be cautioned. Sarcasm aggravates. Just like scratching an insect bite will spread the poison and further irritate it, the use of sarcasm can take a small disagreement and turn it into a verbal war. And you see, that's the idea. When I say to the person who's given a criticism to me, yeah, well, I'm not perfect like you are, it turns the conversation, doesn't it? Conversation is no longer about what I did wrong. It's now about the other person. You're not perfect either. And how are they going to respond? Well, like many do, it becomes a now list of problems, back and forth, back and forth, cut, recut, cut, recut. And we just keep spreading that poison around. Sarcasm aggravates. Retaliation. Often the motivation for sarcasm is retaliation. You hurt me, I'll hurt you back. Or it may be we feel threatened by someone says so we can retaliate by using a cutting remark and get them to forget all about that criticism they had of me because now they're too worried about me attacking them. Uh, Satan, really, when you get into an argument, the spirit of Satan would like you to just recall every evil thing that the other person has ever done to you, every unkindness, and we just give them the list, right? <laughs> You've been unkind to me, well, let me tell you about you, and here's my list. And you know, some of it's 10, 15, 20 years old. Jesus admonished his followers to forgive, and you will be forgiven. Forgiveness means letting go of past hurts rather than holding on to them. In our marriages, it's very destructive 
when a criticism is followed by a laundry list of problems 20 years old. What that says is we haven't forgiven them. We might feel like we do, but we certainly haven't forgotten them, and we're ready to dredge them up. In the spirit of forgiveness, if we forgive them, we should let them be. They should not be fodder for future arguments. Sarcasm is often used to control people. The more sarcasm is used, the more the other party may yield simply to escape the verbal darts. And so, when it comes down to it, we might say, hey, we won the argument. They backed off. We set ourselves up as superior if we can win the argument. But you know what? Winning the argument shouldn't be what's important. It's how we treat others. Relationships that Milton preached about last week. If we're going to build relationships, we need to be very careful how we speak of each other. These are things that can destroy relationships. Philippians, Paul writes and says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. When we put that into practice and esteem someone better than ourselves, are we really ready to jab them with the stinger of sarcasm? If we care about the other person, are we ready to cut them? <coughs> And you know, sarcasm often alienates the other person. Fast-paced, cutting retorts, leading some to retreat and just stop all communication. You can't have a good relationship if you can't communicate. And you can't communicate if every time you try to talk to someone, you get jabbed. It brings an end to all of that. And you know, when you see things on TV, people are quick with comebacks. Double meaning, sexual innuendos, they're quick with retorts, and in fact, it's encouraged. It's looked up to as desirable. Uh, if you've got something really fast to say, hey, good comeback. In contrast, the things that we should profess is to be slow to speak, quick to listen. James chapter 1. You know, sarcasm shame. Sarcastic remarks often seem like no big deal to the person who made them. But to the recipient, these words can make lasting impressions that scar to the very core of the heart. These cuts can belittle, cause shame, uh, cause shame, feelings of worthlessness and desperation, and even depression. 1 John chapter 4, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. He's not telling you the truth. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. This comes to the very core of what we profess. If we profess to love God, we need to be loving our brother. And if we treat our brother in a way that does not exhibit love toward him, guess what? It is at variance with what we profess, that is to love God. Sarcasm is often used to manipulate. It's a tactic of self-centeredness. When we use humor or language to manipulate others, who are we thinking about? Are we thinking about what's best for the other person or what we think is best for us? Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than ourselves. We need to take a close look in the mirror. Are we exalting ourselves? Is our goal in life to win arguments? Is our goal in life to be more witty than the other person? Or is our goal to love God, to love our fellow man? Biblical principles, the golden rule, we need to keep that in mind. Proverbs, reckless words pierce like a sword. Like a sword. Brings to mind, when you see some of the verbal sparring on television, it brings to mind, and this is the attitude that some take towards sarcasm. Sarcasm is not bad, it's a sport. You know, when you go and fence, this is called repartee, a succession of interchange of clever retorts amusingly and usually light sparring with words. And so this is a sport. We spar with words. And you know what? We got on face masks and we got on chest plates. Nobody gets hurt. It's just sparring. It's a sport. And that's the way sarcasm is often used. You'll see it in the workplace. You'll see it on television. It's just verbal sparring. Now let me ask you a question. If it is truly verbal sparring, compare it to fencing. If your partner comes into the fencing arena and he doesn't have his space plate, are you still going to jab him with the sword? No, of course not. If he comes in and he's not dressed in his uh, 
uh, suit that has the protective pieces in place. If he comes in in his street clothes, are you still going to wheel the EP at him? And you say, no, of course not. Think about it. When it comes to verbal sparring, you can't see the protection. You can't see how the person's going to react. And so you come in to the workplace one day. Something has happened in the other person's life. You don't know what it is, but they're feeling especially vulnerable. Maybe their wife just left, left them. Maybe it's been a close death in the family. And you say something is cutting. His chest plate's not in place. You don't know it. You're going to bring blood. It is highly dangerous. It is highly dangerous. We need to be very careful to avoid harming our fellow man. Some Christian principles. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Watch what you say. And I don't mean watch what we say in terms of just an impartial observer. I mean as a security guard. Proverbs says, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. I want to live life trouble free. I think you do too. Here's one way. We need to guard what we say. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. When I was young, I used to think all old people were slow especially presidents, but there's a reason for that. They weigh their words. They're careful with what they say. They take the time to consider how people will react to what they say. We need to do that. We need to guard our mouth and tongue. If anyone considers himself religious and doesn't keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself. Is Christianity worthless? It can be if you don't use it. If you don't follow the principles that we profess, your religion is worthless. It does you no good. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And so I ask you to consider, as we ponder the events of this week, think about, do you find yourself having to say certain things to get people to believe you? What does that say about how we deal with others? Do you use humor, which could be taken as cutting, offensive, demeaning, shaming to others, or encouraging contempt toward others. Perhaps a manipulation tactic, perhaps a deception. We haven't said a whole lot about how to be a Christian. We've talked about how to live a Christian life. The fact of the matter is, if you wanted to know how to take care of your Ford vehicle, You'd go to the user's manual, wouldn't you? And you'd get the user's manual written by Ford, the one that created your car, because they know how it's put together. You wouldn't go to GM for a manual on how to treat your Ford. If we're going to go and deal with how do we have effective relationships, how do we live life, we need to go to the user's manual that God created. The way of God is truly the way of life. God loved man. He so loved man that he sent his only son to die for mankind, that we might have forgiveness of sins. And so we ask you this morning, if you need to become a Christian because you have seen that the ways of God are truly the ways of life, if you have fallen short and you need the prayers of the congregation to encourage you and for strength from God, we encourage you to come. This is the time while we stand and as we sing. Let the Bible Speak is presented by the South Mumby Church of Christ in Orlando, Florida. And we want to invite you to join us for our services. You will find our assemblies to be refreshing, built upon the instructions of Jesus when he said that true worshipers must worship the Father in spirit and truth. Thus, we strive to be both scriptural and spiritual in our worship. You can be sure that as a visitor of South Bumby, you will never be put on a spot or embarrassed in any way, nor will there be any pleas for your money. We simply want you to bring an open mind and an open Bible. So why not make plans to visit us this week?